on that note, I'm going to start. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, welcome to our webinar, What Has the Environment Ever Done for Us? It's the first of what Stantec and Kratos hope will be a regular series of webinars that we may host live events too at the LGA in Liverpool, and that's the local government conference for some of you, and COP26 in Glasgow, which is going to be very exciting with people all over the world talking about the environment, climate change and sustainability. So what brought us all together? Well, responding to the climate change is what we want to look at, seeking to transform the way we work, and to live in a, and create a sustainable way of life. We want to help, we want to get those conversations going, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Our focus initially is going to be on the built environment sector, local communities, and the local decision makers who are working to adapt and change as the world leaders seek to lead their own countries in reducing greenhouse gases and to halt, if not repair, the harm we have done to the environment. Today, the local government association published research to say that nine out of 10 local councils have declared a climate emergency. 93% have set official targets for their authorities to become carbon neutral. The barriers to achieving their goals though were suggested as 96% was funding, 93% need for legislation and regulation, and 88% the lack of the workforce capacity. So we'll be looking at whether they are real reasons not to do something or they are just the obstacles that need to be put on the side. Eight out of 10 local authorities have suffered climate related incidents. 23,000 properties in England being affected by flooding during this period that, that they were testing. In 2021, the UK will host COP26 in Glasgow. In the run up, it will be the change that we've all been waiting for. We won't be talking about a B word. We seriously hope we'll be talking less about a C word, but we will be talking about the E word, the environment. So after all, we have taken a little bit of the Monty Pythons and we all know that the environment gives us life. It gives us a truly amazing experience that we live every day. But now we're gonna start looking at the things that we've done to it and how we're gonna resolve it. So the format of the day is going to be changing as we go through. But let me introduce you to the people that are with us. So we have Keith Mitchell, Regional UK Director, I notice, Keith. That, that, that's regional is the whole of the United Kingdom, right? The, the, right, yeah. Region in a North American sense, who are now a sort of parent company, of course, uh, they see the UK as a region. So now I have to be clear. Well, <laughs> it's a nice region to have, I would have thought. I'd have thought so. Vicky Slade is from Kratos and is looking after all our sustainable work. Welcome, Vicky. Jonathan Riggle is the Director of Energy and Natural Resources at Stantec. And he's standing because you don't wriggle, you fidget. Uh, yeah, all of that, yeah. Oh, okay. And Jenny Hughes, who's going to be having the nicest moment of this event when we get to the climate hero of the month. Uh, is the Climate Change and Social Values Manager for Stantec. And we have, thank God, a very tolerant special guest today, Jonathan Smell, who will be interviewed by Jonathan Riggle. And uh, Jonathan is uh, the founder and CEO of Human Nature. Thank you, Jonathan. And please join in as you wish. Put us right as often as you wish, because while there are experts here, none of us have got the perfect answer so far. So how's the whole thing going to work? Well, let's go over to Keith. Keith, explain to everyone that's been mad enough to join us this afternoon why we decided to put on this webinar. I'll certainly try. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. Um, so uh, why do we want to talk about the environment? Why do we want to talk about climate change? Uh, why do we want to talk about it now? You know, why is this point so important? Um, here we are all sitting remotely in our homes, uh, worrying about uh, tier one, two, three uh, emergency measures and um, uh, vaccines and all these things that are on the very front of our minds, no doubt. Uh, and if that weren't enough, we're sort of also thinking about whether or not Boris is going to be able to do a deal in Brussels and what that all might mean. Um, 
But actually behind all of that has over the last few months has sat this absolute avalanche of policy that has been coming out of government. Uh, and um, it started really with the planning white paper, planning for the future. Uh, in the summer, we started talking about local government reform. We had a 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution, which was uh, pre prefaced by build back better, um, which, <laughs> which often seems to be uh, more about build, build, build than build back better. In, but, you know, we'll come to that. Uh, the, we then saw a, a new national infrastructure strategy, a review of a green book, um, an energy white paper coming out today, uh, and just a, a week or so ago, uh, and you might think this is a strange one to link in with the built environment conversation, uh, but the path to sustainable farming, um, you know, talking about major changes in our agriculture, intensification uh, of farming, uh, and rewilding of large tranches of the UK um, uh, green infrastructure. You know, th this has a potential for having a massive impact, but how real is it and what sort of changes might that see? And what does it, all of this policy tell us about the priorities of uh, and our UK government? They're obviously worried about um, Brexit and repatriating policy to the UK. They're obviously worried about uh, a, a smart, clean recovery or any old recovery. Uh, they're also worried about levelling up and defending the new blue line. Uh, and are they worried about uh, growth uh, in, in one way or another way? Does it really matter or is it or is, it, is, a, is smart, clean growth really what they want to try and achieve? Certainly government wants us all to believe we're going to be at the forefront of a global race to net zero. But have they got all of us on board? You know, if, if, we, if we see that, we, that achieving net zero uh, by 2050, by reducing our emissions by 68% from a 1990 base by the end of the decade, if we're going to achieve all that, uh, doesn't that mean that the rest of us have got to play a part in that? And who's been talking to us about what we've got to do? Uh, maybe you think uh, you're part of uh, the, the uh, of the UK population that thinks that you don't really need to worry about it because actually technology is going to sort all this stuff out. Um, you know, we've seen how decarbonising the grid has made a dramatic change in terms of the carbon generation of electricity generation in the UK. Uh, surely, you know, we've seen electric vehicles coming, uh, automated vehicles, uh, that's going to change transport. But actually, transport uh, is now uh, the largest remaining greenhouse gas emission sector in the UK. Uh, and it has been remarkably resistant to change. So why is that? Why is it that we've found it so hard to move people to travel about less or in different ways? Uh, why is it that uh, we've been able to change very little about the way that our housing development works and the way our land use planning works. Why do we still have house designs that have two cars in the drive? And why is it that we put up with the after effects of all of that happening? Or maybe you're on the policy team. You could be one of those uh, uh, part of the UK population that thinks it's great. We've, got, we've now got a 10 point plan. Um, this will get us to meet all of our policy targets. Uh, net zero is well on the way, uh, so that's all fine. Uh, but in truth, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know, Nick, how long you've been uh, uh, working in this sector. Obviously, um, not that long, I'm sure, really. Uh, but uh, sadly, I remember uh, the publication of uh, the first policy document in land use and planning to look at integrated transport and land use, PPG 13, 1994, uh, publication of the Satra report into the report that declared uh, that roads generated traffic, 1994. We've been writing policy documents on a regular basis ever since then, and I can't really see that that's led to the sort of systemic and radical change that would be necessary to achieve the level of carbon reduction that we're seeking. 
So what's holding us back? We know, why aren't we changing? What, what is it that we've got to do? Maybe we're all part of somebody else's problem team. Somebody else is going to sort it out. Look, I mean, it's all very complicated. Why do we got a 10 point plan? Why can't we have a, I actually heard somebody in the BBC interviewing uh, a government representative about the 10 point plan for the green industrial revolution, complaining that it was all too complicated. And please can we just have five points instead? <laughs> <laughs> oh, why not? Uh, you know, why did we have to bother trying to figure out how all of these complicated things, they're all so difficult, how, how do we align them? Do we really have the funding? Have we, have we engaged with enough of the, uh, of the people who really matter to try and make that change? Um, why should we change habits? Why should we change our lifestyle? Why should we spend our money in different ways? Surely we can carry on as we are and just offset all of our carbon and let somebody else do it. Uh, well, I suspect that that's not the answer either. So why should all this matter? You know, I think it's a really important question because there seems to be pretty universal acceptance that the change is necessary. Uh, and in the built environment sector, that we know a lot of some of the answers and we know how to decarbonize buildings, we know how to decarbonize transport, we know how to decarbonize energy, we know really the sort of decisions that need to be made in local government and where the money used, needs to go. But how do we get all of this stuff to line up? And how do we get the markets that we're working in? willing to buy the housing and development products that we're going to need to sell into the market uh, 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 and implying different lifestyles. You know, how are we going to make that change if all we think is that it's somebody else's problem? After all, you know, what has the environment ever done for us? Why should we change? So why is this so important? That's, I think, a key thing that we want to talk about uh, and try and to get underneath the skin of the complexity of this issue, try and shed a light onto uh, uh, why certain policies are being developed in certain ways, challenge some of the preconceptions about what's going on in, to, in, in the way in which the development industry is working and figuring out how all of our roles might be able to adapt to be able to move forward on this agenda a lot more quickly radically uh, and in line with a way that creates a community that people want to live in as well as protecting the environment in, over the long term so those are my aspirations nick well i think they're very noble very good ones uh, johnny what are your aspirations for this it's to have a conversation about the trickier elements of the transition to being a net zero uh, country or even a net zero globe. <clears throat> I tend to find that uh, a lot of the kind of narrative over the last 25 years, and I really look forward to, to talking with Jonathan about his experience over his, uh, his illustrious career. Um, because as an environmentalist myself, I don't eat mung beans, by the way, before we get on to that. Um, <laughs> Uh, although I did check out, I've got chia, chia seeds in the cupboard, if that counts. Does that, do I, can I put a reference into to Boris to see whether I can count as an environmentalist because I've got chia seeds? Um, yeah, a lot of the narrative has been wrong. It's got wrong. Uh, Some people uh, can't hear you properly, Johnny. Oh, so no. OK. Um, yeah. uh, let me see if this makes a difference. Um, uh, uh, does that make a difference? Hopefully that will do. That would hope, yeah, as you pitch it around, yeah. Um, so, uh, so what I'm hoping to have a narrative or conversation around those tricky, tricky conversations, and open that up and do that in a way that actually we, we can we can laugh at ourselves to a certain extent of the mess that we've got into. And as an environmentalist, um, really, just my my first of all apologies because over the last 25 years of my career, we've got to the point where actually there's a few things that have moved on, but a lot of things haven't. So anything that I've been doing or saying as a profession professional in this space seems to have got stuck a little bit and actually for from myself as an environmentalist to be able to pass this on to generations coming through our own organization but also into other people and have that conversation is, is really important um and i and i kind of reflect a little bit on on boris's comment he made at the weekend about um was it hair hair shirted mungo bean eating uh, individuals whatever <laughs> whatever the long 
but really interesting the kind of the the use of that language to essentially well I don't think it denigrates but like just to compartmentalize environmentalists as this kind of group of kind of people bleating out here that recognizing that actually what they've been saying actually was was fundamentally true but for 35 years it's been true uh, is something that we need to get over and actually rather than judging people for for what how they appear actually listen to what they say got to say for what they've got to say and the meaning behind it yeah right. johnny i should really have included the mung beating mung bean eating team as well as the other three teams that i i mentioned because clearly there's a whole other sector of the uk population that has been seen the need to try and achieve all of these things but being completely incapable of explaining why <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm not sure boris helped at all at the weekend and jenny what's your aspirations for this uh, my aspirations i'd say it's a bit kind of forward looking to the next year um i mean i haven't been an environmentalist as long as johnny has but i've always been pretty passionate about this and i think it's all about trying to stimulate momentum in 2021 um boris is making some pretty ambitious announcements. I'm sure Vicky's going to talk about that. Um, it's really about, as we say, getting over things, but how do we focus and prioritise action in the next year? I'm quite interested to see how we can stimulate some conversations around that. Uh, brilliant. Uh, Vicky, a politician, how do you feel about the, the announcements? And, and Boris swallows a, a thesaurus on a regular basis, but his latest speech was a bit, a bit of a what do you want out of this, Vicky? I think um, I think I'd like people to understand that politicians, uh, if if you insist on calling me a politician, um, because I, I I hate the term because I think most of us who work in the world of politics don't consider ourselves to be politicians. Um, we just consider ourselves to be sort of community leaders and change makers. And actually, there's a great opportunity for us to lead our communities. And, and I know that um, Jonathan has some comments about whether actually we get in the way um, of actually making things happen. But I think what I'd like to do is, is, is help people to understand that we've got a group of people who want to make a change, a group of people who can help make the change. Um, but actually, those of us who are involved in politics, um, in order for us to be able to make the change, people have got to vote for us. And sometimes these decisions are pretty unpopular. Um, you've only got to look at what's you know, just happened on Kensington High Street last week with that incredible um, cycle lane, which you know, Jeremy Vine was keeping up to date with every, every day and you know, all these amazing people using it. And then they pulled it out because of, you know, a few people in their BMWs wanted to park in it. Um, so yeah, that's a prime example of, of where something that was a real opportunity for good was just sort of squashed on because people were too frightened um, about the fact that we've got the London elections coming up in May. And if they don't get re-elected, they can achieve nothing. So, you know, it, it's trying to help everyone understand how that how that jigsaw fits together, really. And I just hope we can all start thinking a bit more about the next generation, because certainly I'm getting my ear chewed by my teenage uh, cohabitants. But I think that a great aspiration too. That what I was interesting at the weekend. I was thinking about my aspiration. I, I feel I'm a bit late to the party, and it's not really my world that Johnny has been inhabiting for the last uh, twenty years. And uh, and I desperately feel I need to understand it so I can contribute because my thirteen year old is going duh, dad, and uh, that's a and also the, the sense I've contributed to this problem that we're in. And I don't know how to get out of it, apart from going and setting fire to, no, not setting fire, uh, scrapping my car that sits outside rather rapidly. But um, Keith, the focus and everything else, there are lots of things going on at the moment, aren't there? There is. <laughs> there's a huge amount. Um, and I think that's in part the difficulty. Um, and... Uh, if, 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 if what we were able to do through this is to try and sort of try and shine a light on some of the more important parts and the roles that we can all play uh, in, uh, in changing the way in which we approach design in the built environment, I think that would be a major step forward. Um, part of the problem that uh, Vicky relates, um, Kensington High Street is one great example of it, is 
uh, and in fact, you, you alluded it to it in, in the sort of dad reference, um, uh, is that, you know, we've all been brought up, you know, wanting certain things, having certain values, believing uh, that our own self-respect and self-actualization is reflected in my in our ownership of a car or on, or going on a holiday, um, uh, and and uh, our children are growing up with different values and different thoughts about how their self-respect is judged against others, um, and uh, uh, and at the heart of the. Uh, carbon transition agenda is this idea that we are actually going to have to consume less and we're going to have to be more modest in our aspirations uh, and we're going to have to gain our pleasure in different ways uh, and these are really really tough messages politically Vicky I mean absolutely you know how do you sell that um, you know it's not just good enough to say that technology will tr uh, will uh, will solve everything. Certainly in the short term, you know, electric vehicles, great, we can decarbonize the grid, but can we get the energy in the right place? Uh, will it be in a place that is suitable to serve its communities from a design point of view? Will it create the places where people want to be? You know, all of those massive sort of inter interrelated funding and design issues that we need to solve. And even then, once you've done it, you're still generate using a huge, huge amount of energy and raw materials to create the vehicles and the batteries that need to be uh, manufactured, recharged and replaced, which is all about it consuming additional more natural resources, which has, the, has its consequential impacts. Now, until we reduce our, our, our consumption as a society, you know, that we're never going to really sort of be able to, to make the whole thing stack up. And our, young, our younger generations get this. And so how do we quickly under, get a better understanding and the importance of what our young people are thinking about into today's political decision-making? Big so, challenge. Jonathan, uh, would you like to join in on this? Because uh, you've been very patiently listening to us. You know, um, I think I'm a little bit older than everyone else on this call. And so I certainly feel older. <laughs> and, um, and, and I've been involved in the environmental movement and sustainability now for about, I mean, it is literally 40 years for me. And, and I've heard every generation say that it's the next generation that has got these values and views and that they'll drive the change. And I reckon I've, I've probably been through two of those now. And, and, and actually what you always find is that they're not the ones with power, we are. But I, I mostly wanted to talk about the framing uh, of it actually because it, it used to be in the in the 70s and 80s that we talked about all the things you'd have to give up to, to live a, a you know a, a green life and, and the piety was just overwhelming you know and also I just think it's a bit wrong-headed and, and, and anyone that doubts it come with me to Copenhagen for a weekend and you'll have more fun than you've ever had before you'll be breathing clean air there's incredible social life on the streets people sitting out on the streets in, in street side cafes, terrible weather, but they, they do it. <laughs> people cycling everywhere, not just because they've got longer legs, I mean, they do actually, as a matter of fact, but it wasn't caused by cycling, but, you know, it's just this, that they have a, they have a waste incineration plant with a ski slope on the top. You can dive into the harbor from a, from a swimming pool that's been made as part of a regeneration project. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's the future. It's uh, it, certainly if you live in a city, you can live a you can live. It's called they call it hedonistic sustainability. Mm -hmm. It's the sense that it's not about how much you can give up, but how much you stand to gain by creating a kind of clean energy system, a different way of moving around, which is so much more social uh, and friendly and healthy. These are good things. You know, we we have a national health service to try and make us ill from all the things that. You know, if we if we address the clean environment and public health issues, so so fewer of us would be ill or have different kinds of uh, ill health in the first place. So, and I, I just see it the other way around these days. It's about how much we have to gain, while also weirdly, you know, safeguarding the future for future generations. But it is us. It's not going to be our kids. It's been too late. You know, Greta Thunberg's already too 
I mean, she just won't be in, in power as, a, as the prime minister of Sweden soon enough to make all the changes that, that, are, that are necessary. It's, it's us now, it's business leaders, it's community leaders, uh, it's everyone at every level thinking not just about policy, but about immediate actions that we can take that have traction really quickly. And you know what? The more of those you make, however small, they become cumulative and everything gets easier. And so think again, cycling in Copenhagen began in the 60s because the parents were really disturbed by the lead pollution, the heavy metal pollution for, for uh, children in infant schools. So they began a campaign to reduce the traffic next to schools and it, and it turned into a cycling campaign over 15 years. They redesigned the streets to make it safer to cycle, more people cycled, more people appreciated the health benefits of cycling. They did more, they did more, they did more. Um, more cycle routes were put in place. And now, you know, 53% of journeys in the center of Copenhagen are by bike. What is it in London? I think it's about 4%. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's just become easier and better because of, of everyone taking actions at every level becomes this incredible surge of, of good energy on, on, on these kinds of issues. And I think you've brilliantly sort of summed up our hope that we're part of the good surge of people coming together and making things change. I think also the point about the uh, responsibility is very much how I feel, but it's, it's a lack of confidence to actually go out there. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting more confident about not being an old fogey who doesn't know what Jonathan Riggle's talking about, really. <laughs> but, you, the, the starting point with that, though, and, and just to echo Jonathan, is that you're not an old fogey. Uh, and then if you look at them, if you look at age as a, as a, as a concept that we're all going to live longer, you know, there's, a, there's an eventuality to an ageing population which we've got, which is a completely different conversation that actually one of the biggest economic troubles ahead is how do we deal with an ageing population yeah. where people are fitter, healthier more active in their 80s and 90s so if you're 60 now and you've got another 40 years of living then the question is well how do we resolve the impact on the planet because i've still got 40 years to live you know and bring that back so if you're well, 50 look, you've got another 50 years to live if you're 40 you've got 60 years to live we'll, we'll discuss the next 40 years uh, at a later date what i do believe is that we've started off something completely amazing and I expect to read about it in the Sun newspaper tomorrow, hedonistic sustainability. We yes. are transforming very quickly. The language- I'm gonna stick, uh, I'm gonna Jonathan, stick that on a leaf uh, Nick. I, 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 can, I, know that, I know everyone who's uh, watching this is writing it down. That'll get me the support in the boardroom. That'll get me the support in the council, James. <laughs> hedonistic, fantastic. On that note, we're gonna completely ruin the mood by trying out uh, part of our agenda is to look at a new policy every month and it will be difficult to choose which ones. But when you're um, sitting uh, planning webinars, you just think, well, what shall we talk about? And then today the government did it for us. So Vicky, tell us all about the energy white paper that was published and you eagerly read. Well, that's what's quite interesting is that um... I'm still trying to decide whether or not the energy white paper is the is the policy paper of the month, um, because um, until today, the intention was to talk about something different. And and actually, having having tried to read as much as I can of the 170 pages, what has become fairly obvious to me is that the energy white paper um, doesn't have a heck of a lot of new substance. <laughs> if I'm honest, just a bit of a hint for those of you that haven't yet had a chance to read it. Um, there are a couple of bits in it, but bearing in mind that we had, you know, Boris's 10 point plan and then we had the national um, infrastructure strategy and now we've got this. And obviously we had the, uh, you know, the virtual sort of um, seminar at the weekend, sort of, it, it does feel a little lacking in substance. So there's two great things in it, which I think we should be um, relieved about. The first is that, um, We've only got 16 days, is it, and counting until we're no longer compliant with EU. Good God. Um, but thankfully today they have announced that we have our very own UK emissions trading scheme to take us over from the EU one that we're currently part of. So that's a bit of a relief, I think, more than anything else, that they've got that in place. 
And, and frankly, I think that's probably the reason why this came out today was just so that we got some good news about the EU. <laughs> um, and the other thing is the clarification, which again, if you read the, the thing at last month, it was already there, that the Green Homes Grant is being continued for another year which again is pretty good because they haven't spent the money from this year because no one's had a chance to take it up, uh, partly because no one wants to let anyone in the house um, and, uh, and partly because it's so flipping complicated. And I actually went on myself today to the website to try and see what I could qualify for. And uh, I was rather disappointed. Um, you know, I, I already have a combi boiler and I've already got some insulation and I've even got solar panels. So my only option was an air source heat pump, which looks like it might set me back about 10 grand, which I haven't got. And then when my gas man came today because my boiler was broken, he told me that um, if you go below um, zero degrees outside, they, they actually don't make the inside much warmer than 20. And that means I'll have to light my fire, which sort of defeats the object. <laughs> So perhaps I'll pause on that for a bit longer. But um, so, yeah, it, it, it's it's a it's an interesting paper. It's really, you know, really good to read about what the plan is. But it just feels like it's a rep repetition of of the 10 point plan that we've had. So I'm going to go back to what I was originally going to talk about very briefly in to say that it wouldn't be a Boris statement if it didn't have world leading in it, would it? So, you know, he announces last week that the government of the UK has set a world leading target of a 68% reduction uh, in carbon emissions. It was supposed to have been 57 and the Climate Change Committee said that it should be 80. So he's come up with 67, which is interesting. Um, and he's launched it before the weekend and challenged every other country to be as wonderful and fabulous as we are and I've gone through and I can't see that anyone's took him up on the challenge which is uh, slightly concerning but maybe it's a little early but just looping back it's great to have that optimistic target but the climate change committee have said that we're not on track at the moment to achieve the 2050 targets we've already got so call me a cynic it does feel like it was, a, you know, it was a bad news day and we needed to get something positive out there. And it had been a few days since they said world beating. And so he came out with this because it's not, it, it's 68% it's reduction from 1990. And I've done the numbers from 1990 to 2018, we've dropped 44%. And to get to the 68%, we're only going to do 42% in the next chunk so you know and in all of that time going back to what we said about you know bikes we've only cut five percent from our emissions from the transport sector five percent um it feels like there's a heck of a long way to go so i think this is a, a great policy i think if we can do it that'd be amazing um while we're still subsidising fossil fuels more than we're subsidising renewables, that feels like a bit of a mixed message. So policy statement of the month is world leading target 68%, but I'll believe it when I see it, particularly as if I can put my, my marker down for April, April is when we're expecting Department of Transport to issue their um, zero sustainable, no, sorry, their, what's it called? Um, zero carbon decarbonization of the whole transport sector in April. So uh, I'm going to get ready to read that one and hope that that is our April one when we find out how we go from 5% reduction in 18 years to, you know, a 50% reduction in the next eight, um, unless they're going to stop it raining, because I, I know my kids complain when I make them ride to school in the rain. Well, and uh, when the Trans Department of Transport does come through with its policy, please look very carefully at all the regulations about um, private aircraft and whether there's an exemption for uh, old ones owned by the Secretary of State who doesn't want to upgrade his fuel emissions. But anyway, but actually, I, I, I Nick, can I just say, actually, uh, international shipping and aviation is excluded from that 68 percent. 
So well, they can have a, they can do what they like. Anyway. Okay. And all imports, just to be clear. Yeah. So, you know, when we eat food that comes from, I don't know, um, the Caribbean, <clears throat> it's not included in the carbon accounting. And, 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 and perhaps I could just add as a rider that the, the, the big reductions that have happened so far have nearly all come from the shift from coal to gas. And gas is a greenhouse gas. So all the easiest stuff has now happened and it gets cumulatively more difficult. And there's a rather um, uh, important um, global stat on this, which is something like 79% of the world's energy still comes from fossil fuels. And that all of the, the total amount of clean renewable energy, all it's done is dealt with the increase in energy demand in the world. It hasn't actually cut the use of fossil fuels. And, and, and I say that not because I'm depressed about it, although I am a little bit, um, but it, it, we just need to understand the, 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 the real nature of the challenge that we've got. And because we've been an industrial nation longer than anyone else, our, our sort of moral responsibility actually is to be carbon positive incredibly quickly. And actually we're one of the countries with a, with a coastline and enough wind and enough sun and enough geothermal uh, actually to, to deal with that fairly readily. And as we do, we can become, um, we could become world beating actually in those sorts of uh, technologies if we applied our minds to it. Well, very positive. Uh, Jonathan, uh, Johnny, it's time for you to interview Jonathan. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, we've got a long way to go. Uh, I'm, I'm an optimist. Um, I thought it was very interesting to see in the Energy White paper the first time that I'm aware of things like greenhouse gas removal being cemented within a policy position to enable that and actually knowing you know teams at Edinburgh University, Oxford University, Cambridge who are really investing time and effort at major greenhouse gas removal technologies that's got to be part of, part of the, uh, the, the, the suite of things we uh, deliver out in order to achieve our targets because we can't just do it by everybody cycling. Uh, it's not, it's just not, it doesn't work that way. Um, so, so with that, I mean, it, it, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to welcome Jonathan to this conversation. Um, I've known Jonathan and I was looking back in my, uh, in my records, Jonathan, almost a decade now from the days that we first met uh, up in rugby. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, as already said, he's had an illustrious career in, in the world of environment and I didn't say that, Jonathan, you said that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had a career, it's true. Yeah, what a career, absolutely. Starting all the way back from your days at Greenpeace uh, uh, as MD there, through to um, the Earth Centre as the Chief Executive. Um, from the days that I first got introduced to you at Beyond Green and then into Human Nature, your, your development business um, but with all of that background you you have and I look I look to you, I listen to you uh, often a, a very great understanding of the sum of the parts of the concepts of sustainability and sustainable development and here in the context of what we're talking about in terms of sustainable development um, it'd be good to get your thoughts on, on what what does sustainability mean because it started off as a verb to sustain then it, then it became an adjective, sustainable, sustainable development. Then at some point, and you could probably tell me in the last 30 years, somebody turned it into a noun. And I hear this expression all the time, but what about sustainability? Well, what does that, what does that mean, Jonathan? Well, I, I, before trying to answer that um, intractable problem, um, I should just say, point out that my career has actually been a regression um, from being a, a Greenpeace as a director and a campaigner to being a consultant and now I'm a developer. I mean, what on earth is going on? Um, I, sustainability, look, um, the, the, the concept was first coined in, in the mid eighties and made famous by um, the World Commission, the Bruntman Commission. Uh, and, and it really meant, Chris Pintical always used to say in, in shorthand that it means living on the planet as if you intended to stay. Uh, you wouldn't destroy the very thing that supports life on earth. So what is it that we need to do to, to, to sustain the biosphere, which is the, 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 the only way that we can live on this planet, whatever Elon Musk might say, or Jeff Bezos, we're not gonna have meaningful life on another planet uh, 
at all, I, I would say. And therefore, you know, how do we how do we look after the the living mantle, the, the climate, fresh water, the forests, the grasslands, the uh, the rich ecology that who knows what diseases are out there. We've got uh, this extraordinary brush with existentialism with with COVID. Where's the next coronavirus? And w w will will ecology still have the bacteria and the richness to be able to help us to fight these diseases? Will the erosion of nature mean that um, we're more vulnerable? Uh, and goodness knows how vulnerable have we felt with, with COVID. It reminds us just how fragile, in a sense, human life is on Earth. But sustainable development was criticised because it, it looked like it just meant um, as much development, economic growth as you can have. Um, and just in a vague way, could we protect the planet as well, please? That's what it sort of came to be seen as in the 80s and 90s. Uh, then in the 90s, business got a hold of it. You had the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. You had the Earth Summit in 1992. 60 jets a day flying into Rio, bringing delegates. It was the biggest ever gathering of world political leaders. Um, and, and, you know, climate change became an issue that had science behind it. Um, we now have satellite images that can show us really precisely how much precious rainforest is being lost every month uh, around the world. Um, we've got David Attenborough um, uh, and other luminaries on in mass media showing us these things. Uh, and so sustainability came to, to dominate in a sense in this discourse because environmentalism gives the impression that all we care about is the environment, that in Greenpeace you would have campaigners to try and stop whaling. And, and for them, whaling was everything. That's why we hired them actually, because they were so almost like psychotically focused on this one thing. But you can't, you can't design a global economy or a global society or a global culture or ways of living around environmentalism per se. You have to embrace the, the human side. What, what is growth? What is development? What kind of economy do we need? What kinds of industries? How do we apply our incredible ingenuity, the science base that we've got now, the technology that we have to craft better lifestyles for ourselves with a, with a fundamentally benign economy? And actually, I would go even further now to say it needs to be a, a regenerative economy. So I talked about carbon positive. We need to take carbon out of the atmosphere and the rich countries with, with this wealth of science and indeed cash ultimately, comparatively still for a few more years yet perhaps, um, to invest in this transformation to create um, a, a way of living and a way of making things and moving around and growing food and building, uh, farming that um, is not just something that can be sustained because it regenerates natural habitats and cleans the air and, and mitigates climate change, but actually is better. So walk on a rewilded farm with set aside. You know, my old mentor and boss, Peter Melchett, the rather unfortunately named Lord Melchett, he was the chairman of Greenpeace, had this very beautiful farm in North Norfolk that he sort of rewilded while farming, you know, it's not instead of. Uh, and, and, and it was just crazy. You'd walk out of this house in the morning, there'd be like a fox, an owl, and a bunny. It was like a sort of Disney cartoon. And you forget what we've lost in a way, particularly in farming. Um, and when good farming practices are brought back, and we use technology for farming, you know, we use intensity with greenhouses and capturing heat in different ways. And we've never been more fortunate in terms of the things that we can achieve really quickly. So sustainability is all, is all good stuff, frankly. It's all, let's get serious. Let's get our scientists and engineers on board. They're the people that make the world go around. Uh, and let's, let's just set the, set the course for this, uh, a change in our economic systems across the piece in 20 years, uh, which will lead to hedonistic sustainability. Our diets will be a dif bit different. We'll move around a bit differently. But it's going to be great. Yeah, 
so so in that and and let's take a a little look backwards then because this uh, this came out the other day or a few a few weeks ago uh, my father turned up this package and in that package was my old school report which I looked through and I now openly give an apology to my mother and father for what happened in the early 90s having read my school report we move on though uh, um you're so you 40 years in this career so you you come across with a very kind of headmaster authoritiveness of of that experience so thinking about the concept of sustainable development then and you were to write your an end of year report for society bankers and uh government what would that what would that end of school report look like for those three three children Oh man. Um, well, look, um, for this year, it's been a it's been a particularly challenging year, hasn't it? And I think we all thought... that's exactly what my school report said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think we all thought that um, there would be this reset thing that that occurred with coronavirus, and actually, more of us are driving now than 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 pre-COVID, and it's been, it's been incredibly challenging. So this kind of strange existential threat. But not, notwithstanding, given that we've demonstrated that we can find money if we need to, goodness knows how it's going to be paid back. We can come back to that if you like. But um, and, and and we can sort of marshal community goodwill and and cohesion, and we can decide that there are these things called priorities, and that government can take action. When when you apply those things to if you genuinely think there's a there's a global environmental problem, if you genuinely think that social justice, as I do, is an is an integral part of addressing environmental problems, then I, I think that we can address them. So by that measure, by that standard, I would say, in terms of leadership, and given how exceptional we are, according to our prime minister, this you know Great Britain. Um, with Dominic Raab saying Britain must lead the way. Well, I'm not sure we were saying that before we um, were going to host COP26 in Glasgow, but I mean, good that we are because it's causing us to make all kinds of commitments and pledges that didn't exist before. If that's what it takes, bring it on. But I, I would say about six out of 10, you know, it's like, a, it's good that they're saying it. Um, we have to hold them to account on it. It's good that they said six out of 10 on energy, I mean, shocking, really. I, I, I would say four out of ten. The the, the the partial energy efficiency in homes piece, you know, the, this whole inability to understand behavioural psychology and the fact that you don't want strangers going in your attic, um, uh, as it as it were, and just the, the the sheer cost of it and the transition. Um, I think that the for me, I will say it's and it's not popular with engineers, but nuclear is a bottomless pit of money. Uh, we, we put astonishing sums and offshore wind is all, already significantly cheaper three years after it was last measured formally as a matter of policy. Uh, solar is coming down in price the whole time, has come down at least tenfold in the last 15 years and will continue to come down because of you know critical mass and demand. So on energy, four out of ten, built environment, zero. Um, uh, uh, built environment, is the single worst aspect of every government policy of the last 20 years in regards to sustainability. We just cut, we just don't get our head around it. it it's just, it's a sort of free pass to volume house builders to build wherever they want, creating whatever they want. Better buildings beautiful is a joke in relation to volume house builders. Every new major settlement is car dependent, has no local economy. Um, the only time we ever get, I'm a developer, the only time we ever get knocked back is because we don't have enough car parking. <laughs> I mean, really, literally. They never ask us about climate change. Um, zero carbon buildings are the easiest low-hanging fruit of all time, and we don't even do that, although, albeit we're promised a policy on it by the end of the year. We need positive total carbon footprints across the entire piece. Um, and town and country planning is incredibly important. It's, it, it, it's no surprise that we're an obese population because, you know, you, you, you can't walk anywhere um, in, in new settlements, in suburban settlements. You've got to walk three miles to the corner shop 
or to the local school, but it's so of course you don't, you get in the car, people get in the car. You can't play on the streets anymore. So zero, the, zero on built environment. So how does then the, the, the finance side of that, how does intelligent finance come to those? Because all of those, these aspects about zero carbon homes and, uh, and walkable neighborhoods and cars, and when it comes back to development, you always get this viability card thrown in, uh, which essentially comes down to how do you repackage the finance to make that all work? Yeah, the viability thing is like, <laughs> well, they're all big questions. I mean, the viability thing in development is just, is, is a joke because it's like, I want to do what I've always done. And now you want me to put some green stuff on top. That's an additional marginal expense. Well, no, if you reframe it from the very beginning and do the whole thing slightly differently, everything just turned up a bit. You don't, it's not radical, actually. It's not that difficult. Then the costs come right down and the values can increase. So it's just a, an intelligent reframing on the investment side. Um, look, it's starting to happen actually because of campaigns that um, customer campaign businesses becoming the great hope of the world sustainability movement. I would say weirdly, even more than campaigning organizations now. If, if I thought I'd say that 35 years ago in Greenpeace, you know, our job then was to try to drag them through the gutter you know, destroy corporate brands. And now you're thinking, I look at IKEA and I'm thinking, oh my God, if we had a government that could even think like that in terms of reinventing its entire business around purpose and circular, in, in every, and innovating and the creativity that it releases is just unbelievable. But on finance, Johnny, you're quite right. It's very light touch at the moment. So there's this thing called impact investment and it is a sort of tidal wave that's coming, but at the moment it's still putting solar panels on out of town warehouses and having one car parking space rather than two. And it's about outputs. It's have you got a carbon strategy? Well, yes, we have. What actually happened? What was the outcome? And, and so we need, we need investors to get behind outcomes and start looking at systems, not individual components. It is coming quite fast. I'm, I'm conscious of time. I've got one final question for you. So a short response to this. 7.8 billion people on the planet, give or take a few million here and there. <clears throat> About 4.6 million of them have got uh, access to the internet. Uh, and this is being recorded. It's most likely going to end up on the internet. You've got one message to give 4.6 billion people who hopefully will pass that message on. Who are all listening to this. Who will all listen to this. What is that message? There's a fantastic upside to dealing with these issues now. Once we get on board with it and, and address this stuff seriously, we can regenerate our democracy as well as uh, our environment and, and really use it to create better lives and, and actually much faster than we can imagine. The modern world has incredible advantages. We just need to deploy them in a really systematic way. Uh, and on that note, I'm going to intervene to keep us uh, on track. But Jonathan, thank you. Johnny, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, switch things around because I want Jenny to tell us all about our hero of the month, uh, because Jenny's been putting a lot of research into it and has got uh, quite a deliberation going on. Quite a lot of deliberation. Um, okay, yeah, it's a category I've taken quite seriously because we're trying to inspire people here and bring some positive news at the end of the year. Um, so I thought I'd run through a few people I considered on my hero list before telling you about who I'm actually going to nominate. So firstly, um, one of the big names of the year, uh, it's already been mentioned, Sir David Attenborough. He's a national treasure. I don't think anyone can dispute that. And this year, more than ever, he's actually raised the bar and, and no longer just informing us about um, the challenges, biodiversity crisis, climate crisis, but he also, in his um, landmark series, Extinction, he also put, um, set, the, set a challenge for our green recovery. He put lots of actions in there and asked us to take action. So he's up there for one. However, I would note that some people have questioned what he has done for the environment. Um, I'll just leave that there. <laughs> Another person who's on my shortlist, um, and for one reason, it's because she popped up when I Googled who's at the top of uh, Green Heroes and, and Climate uh, Heroes. So Caroline Lucas, she topped the Women Power Hour from BBC Radio 4 this year. Um, 
she's had some fantastic time um, as an MP uh, in Parliament and uh, they've awarded her this uh, prize for being fearless and holding power to account with unparalleled experience. She was the first Green Party MP in England and Wales, the only one to maintain her seat throughout the decade, so she's undoubtedly um, done some amazing things through politics. So that's one. And a third one, I thought, OK, who's another huge name this year? So not just this month, uh, Greta Thunberg. We've all mentioned her. Um, she's also done an incredible job in terms of holding politicians and the world to account. Um, she has emphasised the action needed is still nowhere in sight. She stuck to her message um, throughout her, her time in the spotlight. Mm. Um, and she's become a huge symbol globally. Um, However, some people would say she's slightly a bit of a, a doomsayer, I would say that. Um, and whether she has done enough to sort of, she's, she puts power to the people, but have people been inspired to act? That's a different question. So those three, they made it onto my shortlist. And then I kind of scratched my head a little and I actually thought, okay, so a hero, what do we define as a hero? It's someone who is admired for courage, outstanding achievements, noble qualities. Is that actually what we need here? we've all been talking about action today. Um, and I'd just like to reflect on something I heard that was quite interesting in relation to the climate crisis. What do we actually need as people who, who want to move and take action? We need compelling stories that give us purpose um, and give us meaning to take action. And for me, in this last year, I'm gonna take a slightly different slant. So my uh, green hero for this month, this year, is going to Brewdog. Um, in August, they announced that they were the, going to be the first carbon negative beer company. Um, I think given the conversations today, I'm even more happy to say that they're on uh, my nomination list because uh, they're truly going to allow us to live a head and stick sustainable lifestyle in future. Um, they're a top 20 beer company in the world, so they've got a huge reach. Um, and I think that they're in, in sort of announcing that they're going to be carbon negative. Wow. They've set out a really clear package of how they're going to get there where they're in going. It includes buying um, huge areas of... I think that's a... Uh, Jenny, I think you're suffering from uh, that ter terrible moment of uh, broadband reach. Uh, but Jonathan, I'm just going to, well, uh, we're, uh, Jenny's uh, not quite with us, but she is. Um, we're going to launch next month, and we do this again, the Hypocrite of the Month. Indeed. Yeah. And what's that all about, Jonathan? Because that's a bit mean, isn't it? Well, it, it, well it, it is and it isn't, actually, because one of the aspects that I've certainly discovered over the last uh, last 20 years plus is a real struggle for us to be able to hold a mirror up to ourselves uh, and um, and realise, you know, the actions that we're all taking uh, actually all contribute to impact on the planet. Um, and we quite often get stuck in a impasse between being fear of criticism, being criticised, and doing the right thing. So I, you know, I know automatically come Glasgow next year there will be a headline paper. I mean, Jonathan's mentioned it already global climate summit and everybody flies to Glasgow uh, and there'll be cries of hypocrisy and how can you have a climate summit with everybody? These things happen. But actually to have these conversations, to have them open and, and actually move on from them and actually to have these conversations before they get to court is probably more effectual and more functional than leaving the hypocrisy to be challenged in a court case or somewhere. So, so hypocrisy is everywhere, and to all extent, we're all a little bit hypocritical, some more than others. And if you're not hypocritical when it comes to climate change, in which case you're, you're extremely self-righteous, so either you're being self-righteous or you're a hypocrite, so you can't, you can't win either way. When it comes well, to... Well, I'm going to, I'm going to cut in because we've got just a little bit of time left. Jenny, I'm so yes. sorry that we, uh, we didn't hear. Uh, we've come to the end of our uh, webinar. What I think all of us would like to encourage is... We've had some wonderful, we've got a nomination for Hypocrite of the Month, by the way, it's Boris. But uh, the, the, we've had a wonderful uh, conversation. We hope that people who have watched will send in their ideas for what we should be covering, because this is a forum that we want to help people uh, understand what they can do and to air some of the big issues of the day 
and with the eloquence and eloquence of Jonathan Smales, uh, try to answer them and make us all feel a lot more positive about the task ahead of us. And on that note, I'm going to finish the webinar. Thank you so much for taking part, everyone, and thank you for watching us. Uh, we'll be back next month, I think. Bye, everyone.